The greatest time of my life is right now. Another sun-drenched day in the Florida Keys. This is my 21st boat. A Dallas Cowboys legend turned tour guide at his personal paradise. So is that your biggest decision each day, Coach? Which, which <laughs> boat to use? Yeah. <laughs> okay, any, many, money. <laughs> if yes. I'm fishing for wahoo or sailfish, I go three miles. Hall of Fame former Cowboys head coach Jimmy Johnson couldn't be any more in his element. I, I, I love it here in the Keys. It, it's great living. You know, when you wake up in the morning, what's the biggest decision you have to make? Well, I get up about 4.35 every morning, uh, get on the computer, check football around, you know, what's happening. Um, then I'll go for a four to six mile walk. Uh, then I'll come back and check the stock market, uh, maybe play a little bridge. The alternative would be if it's flat out there and the wind's not blowing, I might just go get on a boat, put a few beers on the boat, go catch a fish, or if I don't catch a fish, that's fine. You were so regimented for so many years, up and at them early, staying late. How do you do it now? Is it as easy as I want to think it is? I'm still regimented, mm -hmm. and uh, Rhonda gets onto my case. Uh, I still get all antsy when we're supposed to be somewhere, and I tell her a certain time, and then 15 minutes before that time, I say, hurry up, let's go. You know, so I'm, I'm fanatical about being on time. Uh, but I'm regimented still at this time. What made you want to do the book, Coach? You know, I, I really didn't want to do the book. I didn't have that much interest in it initially. And then my attorney, Nick Kristen, who's a close, close friend, he kept saying, you've got to tell the story. You've got to tell the story. And then David Hyde, you know, came by and he said, hey, the publisher would like for you to do a book. And so I said, okay, I'll do it. And once we started telling stories and started talking about all the coaches and general managers and, you know, owners that come down here and say, hey, you know, how do you evaluate talent? That's how it initially started. Then we started telling other stories and we got into it. Uh, I started enjoying it. And it was that kind of the process you and David kind of worked through the stories and, and put the structure of the book together, outlined it, and then... Yeah, he... He, uh, he would, we spent a ton of time together. Yeah. And it all started with the people that came down and evaluating talent. That's how it started. And then he wanted to talk about my relationship with World Wide West. And then he wanted to talk about my relationship with Bill Belichick. And uh, then how was it on Survivor? Then obviously he said, okay, you know, we gotta have a chapter on you and Jerry. Yeah. And so, we went through the whole thing and he put it together. And uh, as it turned out, uh, the reviews have been great. You know, people love it. Well, it was a fantastic read. I do think it is required reading for any Cowboys fan because of the way that you tell the stories. I do want to go all the way back though. What do you think about growing up in Port Arthur laid a foundation for your success? You know, I, I came from, a, I guess you'd say, middle-class family. <laughs> we lived in a little duplex and uh, my dad worked, you know, seven days a week. Uh, he lived one block from a, a dairy where he worked. Uh, my brother and I, we'd go out on the boulevard in front of the house and we'd play tackle football uh, with the kids in the, in the area, you know, black kids, uh, you know, old kids, young kids. I mean, just all of us together, you know, and it, was, it was something, that was my friends growing up. And, and so, you know, when I got into school, uh, you know, it was a little bit different because you had this class and this group and this group, they had their little cliques. And I said, I don't need cliques. That's not how I grew up. That's the interesting part of it, right? Because in the book, you say that your dad said you didn't really differentiate, you know, especially in terms of race right. with your friends. How were you able to navigate that back in the 40s and 50s? Coach? Well, you know, yeah, I, I don't want to say, hey, I know what inner city kids have gone through. I, I, I don't know. Yeah. I haven't been there. Uh, and so I can't put myself in their shoes. But by the same token, uh, I can relate to it. You know, because, you know, I've grown up, you know, with, you know, African Americans. I've grown up with black kids. I, I've, you know, in fact, <laughs> Dan Levitard, the 
the sports writer in, uh, in Miami, he said, I was the first black head coach University of Miami ever had. But, yeah. but, yeah. but I could relate. And, and you know, it, it was, it's almost like my son Chad, who now is successful on the rehab center, yes. he's helping people. I wanted to bring inner city kids into our program at University of Miami. The thing that I'm proudest of, when I got there, their graduation rate was a little over 50%. I put in mandatory study hall, academic counseling. I had my coaches go to the classroom to make sure they're going to class. And the graduation rate went up to 88%. It has stayed there toward one of the best in the country ever since I left. And, and I was proud that I helped somebody. I helped somebody get an education. That's how I treated them. I treated them like they're going to be college graduates. So let's talk about University of Miami. Obviously, swagger is a big part of this book. I think there's a misconception about swagger because most people think that there's a lack of discipline baked into that swagger. Why is that viewpoint not correct? Well, if anybody ever watched our teams play, we were disciplined and we were not a highly penalized team. But I let our guys be themselves. I wanted them to celebrate. I wanted them to be individuals. I wanted them to be enthusiastic. I, th I think sometimes that enthusiasm and that celebration is almost intimidating for the opponent. The biggest thing about swagger is confidence. And our guys were so confident. And we started building from day one, all the way from the time they were a freshman to training camp to getting ready for a game. We were confident we were going to kick somebody's ass. And hit Michael Irvin, hit Michael said it this way. He says, you know, here, we're going to tell you we're going to kick your ass. And then we're going to kick your ass. And then after we do it, we're going to tell everybody else we kicked your ass. <laughs> and said, Coming and going. That's swagger. <clears throat> you know, Coach, when I read the book, and I'm trying to tie this all together, and if I go too far, tell me, but do you think you could have found that swagger in those teams if you didn't grow up in a racially diverse background? It, it would have been difficult for me to relate. Mm -hmm. um, I remember we were in a, a team meeting one time, and we had, it might have been after Eric Williams uh, missed media day, and, and he slept in, he'd been to the gold club the night before, and I just ripped into our guys. I said, hey, oh, you've got a Super Bowl ring, so it's not that big a deal to you, but there's 130 million people are gonna watch you. You know, you, you have a responsibility to get yourself ready to play, and I cussed them out up and down and you know and I, oh i'd let them have it i said you know we got to get ourselves ready to play and so i walked out of the meeting room and daryl johnston and troy was sitting in a chair i said you know my language wasn't for you <laughs> they right. said coach right. we figured you out a long time ago we know who <laughs> you were talking to <laughs> right 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 was there ever a time at the university of miami that you thought you had to rein it in no i at Miami, we were so good. I mean, we, we had such talent. And, and that's the thing about college football. If you're at one of the top schools, the top 12 in college, you got so many players that are so much better than everybody else. You're going to win. And I realized just how good we were at Miami when I went to Dallas. You know, Tom Landry was one of the greatest coaches of all time. But he had three straight losing seasons. And they were 3-13, and 13, worst in the NFL. And, and so I realized that, see, we were winning all those games at University of Miami because we were better than everybody else. Right. <laughs> yeah. Now we got to bring in some talent because we don't have enough talent to win here. Well, you led me, this is like you're running this interview, Coach. You led me to my next, deal, my next topic. In terms of football and success, you talk a lot about the Pygmalion effect. I know you studied psychology in college. How'd you come upon the Pygmalion effect, and when did you decide that was going to be foundational for you and your organization of football teams? I guess you know, because at one time I was going to be an industrial psychologist. I, I, I really enjoyed studying people. And in studying people, you know, how do I get the best out of them? And I told Brian Dable, you know, I said, you know, Brian said, hey, I've been assistant coach all, all along. He says, what's the thing that I've got to do? Can you give me a, a couple of hints? I said, well, I said, Brian, I said, you've been offensive coordinator. You had X's and O's. I said, you walk down the hall. I said, nobody gives a damn. 
I said, but now you're the head coach. Now you walk down that hall and every head's going to turn. I said, remember this, no one wants to be ignored, but especially no one wants to be ignored by the leader. And so Troy and, and a bunch of my former coaches were here a few months ago. They said, the thing about what you did, coach, is you tried to bring out the best in everybody. And, and it might not have been, it might have been just a role player, but if I could bring out the best in him, he's going to help us win. He didn't have to be just a great player. Or if I bring out the best in my administrative assistant or my intern coach, if, if I bring out the best in everybody, the entire organization is going to benefit. But you set those expectations high thinking because of the Pygmalion effect, people would rise to that challenge, right? Treat a person as he is, he will remain as he is. Treat a person as if he were what he could be and should be, he'll become what he could be and should be. I used to have a meeting with the University of Miami guys on Thursday night. I actually did it because I wanted to keep them off the streets. <laughs> and I, <laughs> I, I fed them a bunch of McDonald's hamburgers. I knew if they filled up their stomachs, they wouldn't go on the street. But, but I'd have a meeting, just me. And no assistant coach, you know, and I'd go around the room, and I'd say, what are you going to do when you get out of school? They said, well, I'm pro football. I said, no, no, you can't say pro football. What are you going to do to earn a living to support your family? And then get them to thinking. And I treated them as if they had already graduated from college. And they were going on, and they were going to make a contribution to society. And, and so treat them that way before they ever got there. They were inner city kids. You know, they're, none of their family had ever, nobody in my family ever went to college, much less get a degree. And that's, that's who I was talking to. So I had to put the expectation to them that they were going to graduate from college and go out and get a job and earn a living and support their family. Coach, you admitted that you had kind of become almost tyrannical. Now, I know that your attention to detail works in the NFL today, but do you think all of those particular methods would work with today's NFL players? I think as long as the head coach has got credibility, they've got respect from his players, and they understand you're working as hard, if not harder, than they are, and they also understand you're trying to put them in a position to be the best that they can be so they can earn a big contract. They'll do whatever you say. Uh, so I think it still works. I mean, expectations and discipline still works. I told them, you know, day one, every year, I said, listen, I'm going to be very consistent. I'm going to treat every single one of you differently. The harder you work, the more you do what we ask you to do, the more you meet the rules and regulations, and the better player you are, the higher you are up on this scale. You don't do those things. You're bottom scale. You've got no margin of error. I'm not going to ruin the book for people, but there's a couple of quotes I do want to read. This one really stuck with me. After winning that first Super Bowl, you said, no one had changed over the previous four years more than I had. I grew colder, crueler, less patient, less social, more driven, more selfish, quicker to anger, tougher on everyone, petty and unnecessarily sensitive, unhappier, and elated. How did you deal with all that in the moment, Coach? Did the end justify the means? Yeah, I, I think it did justify the means. Um, but I had to be. Uh, Bill Belichick came down after his first Super Bowl. And he said, what, what's the big thing? I said, you know, I said, first of all, you got to deal with complacency. But then on top of that, everybody's going to want, I didn't get my share of the credit. I didn't get a big enough contract. I didn't, you know, the next year Emmett held out, et cetera, et cetera. And I said, even your assistant coaches, I said, you know, in the NFL, you know, the, the coaches and the players get to be pretty close. And I remember Joe Brodsky, I love the guy to death. He's my running back coach. Uh, Emmett Smith had held out for the first two games. And so Joe was just wearing the rookie running back, Derek Lassick, out, just cussing him, you know, do this, do that. And Emmett's over on the sideline. I said, Joe, get Emmett in there. He needs to practice. He needs to get ready to play. And Joe said, oh, coach, he's a veteran. He'll be fine on Sunday. And, and so even the assistant coaches start to slack up just a little bit. And so I had to be the guy that had the hammer. And that's what I told Bill. You've got the hammer. So I had to be more demanding. I couldn't let them cut any slack. I had to stop the, the food tray after we flopped around against Washington. 
you know. And, uh, you know, it was a role that, you know, Troy says now, you're a completely different guy. We didn't realize you were a, a nice guy. <laughs> but, but that was what my role was. I had to demand that they were the best. So a couple of hours before you won that first Super Bowl, you said you stood on that field and you knew that you had won the game. How were you so sure, Coach? In my entire career, I, I don't think I was ever as confident about a game as I was in winning that first Super Bowl. We, you know, Buffalo had run a no huddle offense and we had practiced with two different units going up against our defense to hurry it up so that they could get ready for the pace. So we were ready for that. Yeah. Buffalo turned the ball over. I told them the night before the game, and in, you can talk to the former players. I said, guys, they're gonna turn the ball over. And when they turn the ball over, we're gonna turn it on. I said, we'll be conservative early. I said, but as soon as they start turning it over, we'll open it up. So don't, don't be frustrated if we don't open it up right off, off the bat. And sure enough, they started turning it over. I, I, I walked on that field, and I, just like I did before every game, I looked around in the stands. People were starting to trickle in. I knew I was going to put that ring on. I, I knew I was confident. I, I never as confident in a game as my life. In the book, you detail the confrontation that led to Jerry's line that there are 500 coaches who could have won the Super Bowl with our team. It was clearly said out of spite. Have you ever forgiven Jerry for that? Will you ever forgive Jerry for saying that? Joe, that hurt. I mean, because maybe there were 20 coaches that could have won the Super Bowl with that team. But I felt like I was a big part of putting that team together. And we were the youngest team in the league and won the Super Bowl. So that, that was going to be a good team for a long time. And for him to say that, and he apologized the next day. But that cut pretty deep. And, um, hey, it's a long, long, long time ago. And, you know, you know, a lot of water under the bridge since then. And so I'm fine with it. And you guys did get together when you got inducted into the Hall of Fame. I won't ruin it for people so they can read the book, Coach. But that exchange where you guys said what you said to each other, was incredibly interesting. And the thing I want to ask you about it is, can you believe that you were both so open about the fact that there was some hate involved? No, I, I think we know, we've probably said hate a few times uh, talking about the other one over the years. Uh, but it's a, it's a I, I said it in the book, I said, you know, people don't, don't understand our relationship because I don't understand our relationship. <laughs> you know, I'm fine with Jerry. I, I, I promoted him to go into the Pro Football Hall of Fame. You know, he's a passionate, hardworking guy, one of the smartest businessmen I've ever known. And I consider him a friend. Uh, but I never know how the relationship is one day to the next. There's one other quote, and this will be the last quote I read from the book, Coach, because it was incredibly telling. When you decided to leave, you said this about Jerry Jones. He didn't respect success. He didn't understand the job I did his ego got in the way. How did Jerry fail to respect the success, and what did he not understand about the job you did? Well, you know, Jerry was so involved in paying off that loan, so he wasn't over on the football side of the building very often, the first three or four years for sure. And we were, we were working around the clock. I lived two blocks from the office, and we were very, very proud of what we were able to accomplish. Taking a team that hadn't had a winning season in three years. Taking a team that was last in the league, going from one in 15 to winning back-to-back -back Super Bowls. I was very, very proud of what we accomplished. And for him not to respect that, that, that hurt me. And uh, I, I don't know that I'll ever get over that hurt. <laughs> you were on a panel discussion with Jerry, and he said that he was gonna put you in the ring of honor. Right. You had the perfect question because you said, <laughs> while I'm alive, do well, you think you will get in while you're alive? I was actually joking when I said, when I'm alive, uh, but maybe, maybe it's a serious comment. Uh, I don't know. I, you know. I would be honored to go into the ring of honor. Uh, there's some great, great individuals in the ring of honor. Um, but, but it's not something I think about every day. Uh, it, it's out of my control, out of my decision. Whatever Jerry decides to do, I'm fine with it. You know, this book really spells out some stories that we thought were out there, but maybe people weren't sure. Do you think this book could 
stand in the way of him making the decision for you to get in the ring of honor? I, I know there's some things in the book that he's not gonna like, but they're truths. I mean, they're facts. Um, and so, and I, everybody that's read the book said I was very complimentary of Jerry. And, and so I, I wanted to be complimentary because, you know, Jerry's done a great job. Uh, but by the same token, I, I'm going to tell the truth as far as what happened back in those years. Uh, so if it gets in the way, it gets in the way. And again, I've got no control over that. The history of the NFL cannot be written without Jimmy Johnson and Jerry Jones. I'll ask you first about Jerry. When they write the history of the NFL, what should they say about Jerry Jones? He's a great owner. Uh, one of the greatest owners in the history of the NFL. And he's made every team and every owner a ton of money. When they write the history of the NFL, what should they say about Jimmy Johnson? Jimmy Johnson was an outstanding football coach that built one of the dynasties of the NFL. To me, this book was also a love letter to your family. What did you want to make sure that you got across to your family when you wrote this book? This book was maybe an apology to Brent, Chad, uh, my mother and daddy who passed away, uh, that, that I wasn't there for them. Uh, Chad went through struggles for a long time, but now is super successful. Um, I'm so, so proud of them. But it's almost an apology that I've sacrificed our relationships to win football games. And uh, we, we've discussed it, you know, in, in recently. And they said, Daddy, he said, we, we understand. And we benefited from all those successes. And yeah, sure, we would have liked to, for you to have been there for us. Uh, but you're there for us now and we cherish that.